George Zimmerman was granted bail today, set at $250,000 by a Florida judge. The terms of bail will be negotiated before Zimmerman is released. He awaits trial in the killing of Trayvon Martin, a case that has dominated headlines for over a month and sparked a nationwide debate about crime, race and the media. 23 years ago, another widely publicized crime exposed simmering racial animosities in the country's largest city and revealed inherent prejudices within the American judicial system. In her book Just Out in Paperback, the Central Park Five, author Sarah Burns explores the 1989 Central Park jogger case during which five black and Latino teenagers were convicted for the brutal rape and beating of a white woman named Patricia Ellen Maile. Burns meticulously documents events leading up to the crime and describes in detail the questionable tactics used by New York City police detectives during interrogations of the 14 to 16 year olds that lasted hours, producing confessions riddled with inaccuracies and inconsistencies. The Central Park Five contextualizes its subject examining the media frenzy that erupted around the case and portraying a New York City in the grips of an unprecedented crime wave, with cuts to social services skyrocketing, dropout rates, and an ever-expanding divide between rich and poor. Burns gives her reader a glimpse into an episode of American history only recently removed and whose race-related issues the country is still struggling to resolve. The full title of the book is The Central Park Five, The Untold Story Behind One of New York City's Most Infamous Crimes, and it's author Sarah Burns now joins me in studio. Welcome to Uprising. Glad to be here. You're here for the LA Times Festival of Books, which we'll uh, tell our listeners about in just a minute. But first, set the scene for our listeners. Uh, you we're so much involved in this uh, crime that took place in Florida, uh, where uh, up until public outrage has forced change, similar uh, themes of, um, of racism and assumptions about race were playing out compared to what happened, of course, completely different case uh, compared to what happened many years ago in New York. Set the stage for us about what New York City was like in 1989 when the Central Park jogger case uh, burst open. Yeah, well, the 1980s in New York were, as you said, a, a very different time from now, certainly, where New York is a very safe city. At that time, crime rates were extraordinarily high. They peaked just a year or two later at over 2,000 murders per year. Um, and so, and, and every kind of crime was was high then. Uh, we were in the midst of a crack epidemic, which was increasing crime and also increasing people's fear of crime um, in many ways. And as you said, these social systems were sort of breaking down. The money wasn't there. The city had just come out of a financial crisis. And so it, it felt dangerous and, and to some degree was dangerous. And the people who were sort of seen as the source of that danger was often black and Latino teenagers. And so these kids in this case were sort of victim to that, these assumptions. Um, and it's what we see today in the Trayvon Martin case. And the victim involved um, was a white woman who worked in uh, on Wall Street, a corporate executive. And so in many ways, the juxtaposition of the victim versus the sus suspects uh, reflected the sort of uh, racial fears that America struggled with. Absolutely. And, and it reflected the divide in the city. I mean, the, Wall Street was doing very well at that time. And there was this incredible divide between the haves and have nots at that time. Um, and it, it allowed for this coverage, too, to really put her on a pedestal. She was not known by name at the time. She was just the Central Park jogger. And so that even more allowed people to she really became this symbol she, of she could be white anybody, womanhood. Anybody. She could be every woman. Mm. Um, and, of course, when you have a case where a black or especially black person, man, is accused of raping a white woman, the history of that in our country is fraught with problems. And it's in this case, it wasn't men, though. It was 14 to 16-year-old right. boys. Children. Who were these boys? And how did it happen that, uh, for listeners who aren't familiar with what happened in 1989 in New York, how did it happen that these five boys were identified as suspects? They were, these five were uh, from Harlem, and as you said, they were children, I mean, 14, 15, 16, they were in the park that night in Central Park with a group of about 30 kids who were running around making mischief and in some cases committing other crimes. Um, some people in that group actually beat up a male jogger and sent him to the hospital. So there were crimes being committed 
by their cohorts and perhaps them we don't actually know exactly what happened but some of those kids were picked up as they left the park and once the jogger was found hours later the police immediately directed their suspicions at these kids and they did what they are very good at doing which is they get confessions and I think these five became the five because they were most vulnerable to giving these false statements, and they succumbed to the pressures that the police put them under. Weren't, uh, weren't there laws protecting these children from being interrogated, for example, without parents or attorneys present? Well, they were read their Miranda rights, which is all that, that is expected of the police, and they all waive those rights to have an attorney present. I think they don't completely understand them, and, and they're not you know, when you are innocent, you tend to waive those rights thinking that you're not going to be in trouble. In some cases, they did have parents there when they were the, the younger kids, but the parents were made less effective both by their sort of through their naivete about the system and also the way that the police were able to keep them in the dark about the extent of the trouble that these kids were in. Hmm. So the parents didn't even know what their kids might have been accused of? Often that was the case. This term that was used by the press, wilding, how did that uh, become part of the case against these young boys? It's an interesting story and one that is somewhat of a mystery. Uh, the word was really first used in this way in this case. And so a lot of people associate it with the case. It dominated the coverage. It was the front page headline of the tabloid papers. But the police told the press in a press conference that the kids had used this word wilding to describe their own activities. They said they were out wilding. They say they never said it. They didn't know that word. It wasn't a word they used. Um, and there's one theory about it where they had been singing the Tone Loke song, Wild Thing, that was popular at the time. And the police had misunderstood or misheard that. Mm. Um, but we'll actually never know what how exactly it came about. But it really did come to represent the case in the media. And the context, uh, I think, should also be mentioned. Earlier, you talked about how uh, this was a, a time w of uh, where, where there were a lot of cuts to social services, and, and we might be seeing the sort of time resurge again today because of our economic climate. But what sort of spaces were there for young kids this age? Uh, and what sort of um, uh, context was there? What sort of uh, opportunities were there for young kids to have safe spaces to be? Right. There, there were not many. I mean, the, the types of programs that might have provided those spaces were not being funded and not in place at that time. And in fact, the father of Raymond Santana, one of the Central Park Five, had told us that he, when he, that night, he told his son to go to the park to hang out because he mm. thought the, cor the street corner wasn't safe for him. And so he said, go play in the park, thinking that that was a safer place for him to be. I'm speaking with Sarah Burns about her book just out in paperback called The Central Park Five, The Untold Story Behind One of New York City's Most Infamous Crimes. She's going to be at the LA Times Festival of Books this Sunday at 12 noon at the Bing Theater at USC. She's going to be on a panel entitled Elbow of Justice. And uh, KPFK is going to be covering this festival of books and is also going to be present at the book festival. It's happening at the University of Southern California, located at the intersection of Exposition Boulevard and South Figueroa. KPFK and the Pacifica Radio Archives will be at booth 937 in Alumni Park on Saturday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. and on Sunday from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. And on, K uh, on Sunday, KPFK will broadcast live from the festival with hosts Andrew Tonkovic, Maria Armudian, and Ian Masters, along with Uprising producer Martina Steiner and many more from the KPFK crew. So definitely stay tuned to KPFK on Sunday if if you're not there at the festival yourself, and if you are there, do check out Sarah Burns' panel on Sunday at noon at the Bing Theater. So the, uh, the, the real perpetrator of the crime, it was eventually found out, was a man by the name of Matthias Reyes, serial rapist, who I understand uh, from, from your book, while the police were fixated on the Central Park Five, was off committing a whole host of crimes, many rapes. Yes, and, and just... Tragedy upon tragedies in this case, the attack on the jogger, the wrongful convictions of the five, but also these crimes that Matias Reyes committed after he raped the jogger that could have been prevented had the police done their jobs and seen the problems with this case, seen the problems with the statements, and 
put together, I mean, followed the evidence that was really in front of them and put together the fact that he was the rapist in this case and they, they could have found him. Um, he had raped another woman just two days earlier in Central Park, um, but it was interrupted and so he didn't inflict the same kind of grave injuries on her and she gave a description to the police that allowed them to discover his name in connection with that crime. And two days later he rapes a Central Park jogger, but because they are so convinced that these teenagers were guilty, they didn't make this connection. And was there any physical evidence connecting the teenagers to the jogger? There was none. And this was in the early days of DNA testing, mm -hmm. and they actually did test their DNA, and it was negative. There was no match. And they moved forward with the prosecution with a kind of crazy theory that there must have been one other kid who got away rather than reevaluating their whole case, which is what they should have done. So what sort of effect did this case have um, in New York City, particularly, for example, let's start with the media for one thing uh, before we go on to the public. Uh, the media played a big role, as you describe in your book. How did the media take what the police said at their word and, uh, and sort of uh, put their own spin on it? Well, I think there was a real failure of journalistic skepticism. Um, they really took the police at their word. I mean, they, for the most part, bought this information that was being provided at these press conferences by the police and printed it without the kind of skepticism that you would hope that they would have, looking more carefully at the statements and recognizing the problems with them. Um, and while a couple of people did that, they were such minor stories relative to this just massive media push. I mean, it was on, this case was on the front page of the tabloids in the city six out of seven days in a row that week, and then continued throughout the trials. And I mean, this was a huge story, and it really captured the city's imagination in terms of their fears. And what happened to the five boys in the end? They were convicted in two trials, and they served between almost seven and 13 years in prison each. So lost uh, so many years of their youth. So many years. And even when they were released, they were registered sex offenders. Um, you know, they weren't paroled earlier because they wouldn't admit their guilt and express remorse. And that is the way you get paroled. And so they probably served longer terms because of that. And Corey Wise, who was 16 years old and therefore not subject to these juvenile sentencing limitations, served 13 years. Oh and it wasn't until after they were released that their convictions were vacated based upon Matias Reyes's eventual confession in this case many years later. Well, uh, finally, Sarah Burns, how did you um, decide as an author, how you were going to write this story. And I should mention you're also working on a documentary about the same case. Based yes, on yes, we, we are just putting the finishing touches mm -hmm. on a documentary film. So how did you decide to write this case? Because it's like a true crime fiction, and, which is, of course, true in this case. But did you, what, what decisions did you choose to make this a readable book? Well, I really wanted it to be accessible. I wanted it to read like a narrative um, and not be an academic book. And I'm not an academic. I don't have those qualifications to write an academic but book. But you went to Yale. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I actually wrote my undergraduate thesis in American Studies at Yale about this case. Mm. So I've been so had a long... sort of focusing on this case right. for a number of years, um, and it's continued to capture my imagination. I feel very passionately about it, obviously. I continue to have do you met many any projects. Have the, the young men? Yes, I spent a lot of time interviewing them, mm -hmm. and um, in our documentary, they all appear in the film um, telling their own stories, too. And it, so it's, it's very different in that sense from the book because I, I spoke to them, but it's sort of my, my telling right. of their story. And now we have this opportunity to actually let them, in their own words, tell their story, which mm -hmm. is exciting, too. And when's the release date for the film? Well, we are not sure, but we just found out a few days ago that we have been accepted at the Cannes Film Festival in May. So that will be our world premiere. Fantastic. Congratulations. Thank and we you. hope to cover that film when it comes out here in Los Angeles. Sarah Burns, I want to thank you very much for joining us today. Is there a website you'd like to recommend uh, to share your work? Um, Random House has a website for the book. Um, and our Florentine Films is our company, but we don't really have a website up yet for the film. So We'll link to the book's uh, website from our website, uprisingradio.org, later today. Sarah Burns, best of luck to you. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me.